your speakers said, tell a story. So I'm going to tell a story. Once upon a time, a planet was discovered in our galaxy that was, had all the conditions for life. In fact, it was already teeming with life. And those who discovered it said this would be a perfect place to hang out with our extra population if only we could deal with the existing inhabitants, if only we could somehow entice them into a world of slavery where they could provide us with all the goods and services that we would need to live lavishly on that planet. And so they thought about this and they concocted a clever scheme. They built a technological spore, a shiny, wonderful object, and they sent it by spaceship to the planet, where it landed gently, a gift to the inhabitants of the planet. At first, the inhabitants were frightened and anxious about it, but their scientists studied it carefully and figured out that it wasn't toxic or explosive or dangerous in any way. And in fact, they soon discovered it was really quite entertaining and useful. There were many things you could do with it. And so they reverse engineered it and figured out how they might make copies. Pretty soon they'd made a few hundred or a few thousand copies, which they distributed around, and sure enough, people just loved them. So they made more and more, and pretty soon these spores were reproducing by the millions and billions until the inhabitants had carried them to the farthest corners of their beautiful planet. Pretty soon just about everybody was working night and day ultimately to provide the energy needed to run these things and to make sure they had the latest version of it. Now, of course, this is not a science fiction story. There's only one false sentence in it, and that is that the gift came from outer space. We made the gift and gave it to ourselves. And it seems to be a tradition here of taking out your own personal descendant. So here's mine, a recent descendant in the long line of these magical gifts, these replicating spores, not from outer space, but from right here on our own planet. Now, are we dependent on them? Are we, in effect, enslaved by them? Well, let's just stop and think. Whatever your job is, whatever company you run, do you have a plan for how to go on doing business if the internet goes down. I mean, crashes. How would, you, how would you inform your customers? How would you get your supplies? How would you make plans with each other? How many of you have, have such a plan? Really, wonderful. How, fore how foresighted of you. How many fire engines, fire stations, and police stations, and hospitals have carefully worked out plans for how to go on doing the services that are so important if they were to lose the internet? How many newspapers and television networks and so forth have plans for how to deal with the calamity that would happen if the internet went down? Almost none, I think. Our lives now depend, depend on this technology. To get the prescription drugs we need when we need them, to get the food we need, to get, to get fuel to the, to the petrol stations when we need to for, for, our, for our vehicles. And we haven't got any plans for how to deal with all of those needs if the method that we've now come to adopt were to become suddenly unavailable to us. That's one problem. 
Now, I'm a philosopher. Here's some bunch of philosophers. I didn't put my own picture up here. We were a funny-looking lot. And we agree about almost nothing. There is one thing that philosophers from I pretty much Socrates on, I think, have agreed on, and it's this. Ought implies can. Ought implies can. Sort of a bumper sticker in ethics. <laughs> what does it mean? Well, turn it around and you see the implication of that is that I can't implies I'm excused. It is not in my power. I'm sorry, I can't do it. Since I can't do it, I'm not obliged to do it. It is outside of my remit. It's just not within the powers that I have to do. Now, here's the problem. We've had an explosion of can-do. Ray Kurzweil is right. This is an absolutely unparalleled explosion in can-do. There are things that we can do now that we could never do before. You can, with a touch of a button, provide for meals for children in Africa, build schools all over Asia, uh, and a thousand other things you can do now that your, your ancestors could never do. We do live in a global village, and we can help people all over that village. Well, that's wonderful, isn't it? We have an explosion of can-do. Here's the trouble. This is my Ray Kurzweil-inspired graph, the explosion of can-do. <laughs> Steep exponential curve. Here's the problem. With the explosion of can-do, there's a compensatory waning of excuses, which some of you will have noticed. And the waning of excuses leads to the waxing of guilt. Let me show you. Explosion of can-do on the left. We see that people really are doing a lot more than they ever did before, and a lot of good. So. So, does, rises happily. But what about that space in between the two curves? It's filling up with guilt. <laughs> and no technology can remove it. Let me repeat that. No technology can diminish that. That is a job for philosophers. <laughs> but... We're not doing it. We're not, we haven't figured out how to do it. We have new obligations because we have new powers. Some of them are relatively trivial. I'll give you an example from my own uh, life and professional life. Google Scholar, it's a wonderful thing. Marvelous. It now means that you can, touch of a few buttons, you can have found right there and scroll through them hundreds or thousands of articles that have already been published in scholarly journals that are relevant to the thing you're working on. It's called a literature search. I can find hundreds of potentially relevant papers in the literature that anticipate my work. You know what? I don't want to. I don't want to spend my days scrolling through other people's works on the off chance that I find just exactly something that really deserves a citation. So you know what? I don't. Nobody does. Almost nobody does. So what do we do? We continue our lives, our professional lives, with a little guilt. That's not a big deal. GPS, wonderful. Many people have pointed out that now that we have GPS, people are forgetting how to read maps. <laughs> They're losing their natural sense of geography. Well, I'm a sailor, and I learned how to do navigation with a, with a, with a sextant when I was a kid. I've never really been able to use that to save my life. 
And now, of course, it's too late because I've got a GPS. <laughs> Takes all of that out of my hands. But it's not just that I can use it, I'm really obliged to use it. You know, my insurance company on my boat, they don't want me going off across the ocean without a GPS. Actually, without two or three, in case the first one breaks. So what we see is also the waning of adventure. It's just not possible to live as exciting a life on the sea as it used to be, because <laughs> the GPS just takes you right there. Well, again, you might say that's quite trivial. Well, let's compare it to something which isn't trivial at all. Here are some life-saving adventurers. What a wonderful life's work to be a doctor. We've heard about this earlier today. Because doctors are good people, because they have a sense of obligation, they feel obliged to use the latest technology in diagnostics. And so they do. And the technology is becoming so good that they now, in good conscience, can no longer do those seat-of-the-pants diagnoses that were so thrilling to do in the old days. They have to check it against what the machine says, and if the machine says no, they dare not risk using their own better judgment against the machine. This is, we're, we're at a tipping point right now, but it's going to get worse. So what's going to happen to being the profession of being a doctor in the future? They're going to become all bedside manner and a few button pushes. You say, well, that's still pretty good life. Well, is it? They're going to become what we might call medical receptionists and doormen. very classy to have a doorman out in front of your building. It's really not necessary. But they smile, they say hello, they've got a good sort of roadside manner. You know. And as Pam says, I don't think it's many girls dream to be a receptionist. And this I think is a serious problem. What good jobs are going to be left? If as wonderful a job as being a doctor is threatened with the onset of technology. Well, electricians, we're gonna need lots of electricians. <laughs> How about computer repair technicians? No, because if Ray is right, you don't repair a computer, you just discard it and get a new one. It's so cheap and twice as fast and twice as powerful. So we won't have those. Plumbers, we're still gonna need plumbers and farmers and lumberjacks. And of course, philosophers, you know, nobody ever. <laughs> Nobody's ever figured out how to, how to uh, replace a philosopher with a machine yet. But I don't know if that's such a good thing, actually. And after all, how do you know that I didn't get my talk here today from some expert system program that I consulted in my hotel room last night? You just have to take my word for it. Well, you might think, well, how about the arts and how about music? Musicians? As you know, the great studio orchestras that used to write the music composed for the soundtracks of films, those are pretty much a thing of the past. They can be put together, they're still musicians, but there's not as much work for them anymore because of all the synthesizers. Synthesizers have made it possible to create a rich orchestral score without hiring all those musicians. Well, at least, you think, there's the composers. The composers of the music, we haven't got them. Well, that's not really true. The composer David Cope, a few years back, wrote a program called EMI, Experiments in Musical, uh, Experiments in Musical Imagination, and he fed it the works of Bach, and it proceeded to write Pretty good Bach two-part and three-part inventions. He fed it the music of Scott Joplin and it wrote some pretty good rags. He fed it the music of Brahms and it wrote some, some excellent Brahmsian music and so forth. Then he began feeding its own music back into it after it had been influenced by Brahms and Wagner and so forth and it began to write its own symphonies. 
How good are they? They're not bad. EMI has written over a thousand symphonies, and at least one of them has been uh, produced, uh, has been uh, uh, played by a, a major orchestra. Think about the role of potters. Potters used to be highly valued specialists in society. Not anymore. Now, they make goods for boutiques. It's very nice to have a set of handmade dishes and so forth. But a potter no longer has the importance in the community. It's just a luxury item on the side. Boutique heart surgery is just around the corner. You know, the rich and fanciful can say, do you like my triple bypass? It's all hand done. It's <laughs> by my own special doctor. So here's, I've given you two downers, the enslavement, the dependency, the loss of meaningful employment, it's time for an upper. And that's increased information transparency. That's wonderful, we've been hearing a lot about it. It spells extinction for dictatorships. I think that's actually pretty clear. The March Arab Spring, is, Arab Spring has pretty well shown us that. It's also wreaking havoc with religions, a topic that I will be speaking about in Sydney on Sunday. But at the same time, this transparency is also wreaking havoc for security. Uh, go to the web and type in, I can't remember the name, but just uh, the German malware. It's just been discovered that the G German government has some malware that it has developed which can go out and, and surreptitiously get on your laptop if you're on the, on the internet and not only download every keystroke you make and, and download your screens, but put files on your computer without any trace. So if you're an enemy of the government, you may wake up someday and find that your laptop is filled with child pornography. You'll discover this five minutes before the authorities arrive and arrest you, and you will not be able to prove that you didn't put it there. Privacy is something we're going to be giving up to. In other words, folks, welcome to the fast lane. And I just want to leave you with a parting thought. There's no exit strategy. <laughs> Thank you very much.